welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. Delighted to say I'm here with Alain Hankins. Uh, Alain has written the book Cracking the Leadership Code, Three Secrets to Building Strong Leaders. Alain, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Richard. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be with you today. Absolutely. So uh, this uh, is a very clear book. Uh, it's a wonderful book, which uh, really distills your experience of working with what th thousands of organizations now yeah. um, in, in this field of, of leadership, of building leaders, developing leaders. Uh, it's also, uh, to some extent, a personal story of it, sort of how you came to working in this way. Um, so, and I wondered if we should start there, a little bit of the backstory, uh, which you do outline at the start of the book. Um, yeah, the, your, your childhood and, you know, how that sort of frames your interest in this area. Yeah, happy to, to share some of that. So, yeah, I think that for most of us, once we get to be adults, you know, sometimes you find yourself in these positions and you think, gosh, you know, when I was six or seven or eight years old, I never would have imagined this. But if we kind of pull the threads and go back towards the beginning, I'd say that a common thread in my life throughout has been, I've been fascinated by people. Like, why do people do what they do? What motivates them? How do they influence others? And as I write about this in the book, I think I was very much informed by my fairly unique childhood experiences. So just some background on that. So I was raised in New York City, not very unique, raised by a single mom and my grandmother. Again, not particularly unique in that way either. It's pretty common. However, both my mother and my grandmother are Holocaust survivors. My mother's born in 1935 in Brussels, Belgium, hence the French Alain name. Um, and so in World War II, and they're Jewish. So in World War II, from the time my mom was six and a half until she was almost 10, she was separated from her mother and put in hiding with the Belgian underground for three and a half years. And they were separated. They could see each other maybe once every few months just to check in, but that was it. And then my grandmother was actually arrested, brought to a concentration camp, and then liberated at the end of the war. Then the two of them were reunited, and pretty much the rest of the family was killed. And these were my primary parents. So as you can imagine, the trauma of that experience shaped their lives profoundly, and then obviously shaped how they raised me. And so some of the beliefs around what do you say to people or who do you trust and how do you express that? I got some very strong and in fact, some overt explicit messages. Like, for example, I remember my mother once telling me, never tell people anything more than they ask you to tell them. Right? It was that very narrow, you know, and that's a very strong overt message for a seven year old kid in 1970s New York City to be getting, which was so different from my experience of going to public school, going to my friends' houses. And so I think part of my interest in human psychology and behavior had to do with recognizing that there was something off here. There was something a bit wrong with this experience and that was shaped by that trauma that they experienced. So my work in a lot of ways has been shaped by trying to reconcile how can people be affected by experience and how do other people affect the people around them with their experiences which led me to leadership. Because as I look at leadership, I define it as a very broad category. I don't see leadership as a position or a job title. I see leadership as a way of thinking and of being in the world. And anytime any of us are trying to influence anyone else to try to get something done, that's leadership. So if you use that definition, we are all leading every day. So that's what led me to doing what I do and this interest and passion for this work. Right. And, and that, and you, and you write in the book how, you know, you're in that sense, the way you've just defined leadership, your earliest experiences of leadership were the leadership example of your grandmother, of your mother. Yes. Right. So yeah, just elaborate on that a bit. So how were they as leaders for you? Yeah. So here's the thing. I mean, yeah, I, I think all of us, our original organization that we learn leadership in is our family unit. That's where we grow up. That's what we think. We think that's normal because right? we don't know any difference. Like that's just the way things are. And looking back on this, and again, I, I look at this through the lens, by the way, I'm not here to blame and bash my mother and my grandmother. They were wonderful, loving people who did the best they could, but they had their shortcomings. And they were also very traumatized by the experiences they went through. 
That said, some things that I noticed in that early origin organization of the family was there was massive amounts of inconsistency. So my grandmother in particular, I mean, she was oftentimes stone cold silent. You know, I, I don't remember her ever really cracking a smile. It's very somber. Dour. Today, she probably would have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder because she would just be kind of in this kind of shell-shocked and numb place. But then she could switch it on where she would just kind of go into this rage over the strangest, most minor details. I remember once trying to make my bed, you know, as a kid is trying to like put, touch in the, the bed sheets in the corners and she came into the room and she obviously didn't think my work was up to the standard that she thought it should be. And she just kind of ripped all the sheets off and kind of yelled like, cause she could just, wow, this rage came out of nowhere. And just, you know, and so, you know, and if you meet people who come from alcoholic families, this is, this is not unusual. I mean, the idea is that there's not a consistent level of emotional affect. And so on the receiving end of that, you close up, right? You just, you shut down and you try. And for me, I just try to disassociate from that experience and detach from it and then try to get emotional needs met elsewhere. So that's an example of something that I was dealing with. And again, that, that particular part is not unusual. Anyone who's been through any traumatic experience deals with that. But one of the things, if you look through a leadership lens, is the importance of how do we as leaders make the people around us feel safe? And part of how we do that is through consistency of our behavior. So people know what to expect. Right. And, and, but, and I think that the broader point here is, is a really important one is that we we develop these leadership models as kids yes and then we take it into the workplace and so we either you know we have certain expectations of leaders based on those early experiences or as we be, start to begin to inhabit senior positions we expect ourselves to behave you know in certain ways as we experience as kids and unless we interrupt those patterns that's that's what will play out and it just reminds me of a previous guest uh, Pim, who's who has an organization called Corporate Rebels, and he uh, took a job sort of out of uni, worked as an engineer, and 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 hated the workplace because he's like he'd been brought up as this carefree kid, where he was free to express himself, and his family environment was completely at odds with the workplace he entered, yeah. and and he bounced out of it and ended up creating Corporate Rebels as a force to change corporate culture such that he could in some ways replicate that early experience that he had in in the workplace in 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 the realm of work so that's that's the link i'm making here as you're speaking yeah well richard you're you've touched on what you know might be the sixty four thousand dollar issue right so it's not a question but it's the issue in that you really can't separate out personal de development from professional development basically how you show up as a person is how you show up as a leader. So what you learned in those initial organizations, we'll call the family in your schooling system, whatever. Yeah, you're not going to show up in your corporate job and suddenly be somebody completely different. And what most of us, in terms of how we've been socialized in the power structures that we have, particularly in the family, families are not, last time I checked, most of them, 98% of them are not democracies. And basically the way it works, and this might sound familiar, but you know, you're a five or six and I know you've got three-year-olds, I've got teenagers now, but the idea, if you go with this idea of power struggle, because I basically, as the father of the family, I can tell my kids at a point like, do this, why? Because I'm your dad, that's why, right? So what I'm doing there is I'm using what I call in the book, old school leadership, which is command and control, basically leveraging my authority to get people to comply. Now, at best in those moments with kids or with employees, at best, you will get people to begrudgingly go along. Okay, well, they're, they're in charge or I'll get fired. So I'll just go ahead and do this. So that's at best. However, anyone who's a teenager knows this. If you have this attitude of do as I say, because I'm your dad, that's why there's going to be a day when they get old enough and they go, who are you? Screw you. I'm out of here. Right. And the same thing with the same thing with employees. And, and so we have to realize that this old school leadership is very short term. Like, look, is there a place to push and tell people what to do? Yes. When the building is on fire, literally when the building is on fire, we're not going to sit around here, Richard. So a building is on fire. There's six exits. Which one do you think we should lead? No, you're not going to want to do that kind of facilitative leadership at that moment. In that moment, it is very appropriate. Unfortunately, too many people default to that. Go do do. 
too much of the time. And it's in their bones. And frankly, this is one of the things that's been on my personal learning journey is how to relearn or deprogram myself because all of that, do this, do that. That was in me. I got that from my mother, my grandmother. And yeah. so I, I'm a dad and my Redo wife- your bed. Well, exactly. And you know, I was smart enough to choose my partner, my wife, who is the mother of my children, who had very clear philosophies around how she wanted to raise kids. In fact, she remembers being about seven years old when you know the golden years of childhood shifted because some, some, somehow when she was seven, she was expected to comply. And she remembers like her father who had done no wrong suddenly became, went from this angelic presence to this demon in her life who went, wait, you have to do this. And, and she said she would remember being that age and said, when I grow up, I will never treat kids that way because she remembers viscerally what that was like. Now, frankly, I can't remember it. It's probably too caught up in everything. But she remembered it and she said, and she talked to me about this before we had kids and I, and I was on board in theory. And then as we started to practice it, what I found were those moments when my kids were little and that old, those old patterns would kind of come out of me and I'd catch them. And particularly, you know, it doesn't take much to see your three-year-old son at the time. I remember, and I'll tell you this, I'll, I'll back this up as a story. So my son is three, Alex is three at the time. This is 13 years ago. And it's my day with him. And you've probably had this experience because you've got three-year-olds where I have to get him off to, I think it's preschool and it's raining. And so I've got to get his rain boots, his galoshes on, his rain coat and like all the extra clothes. And you know, with little three-year-olds, it takes a while to get, you know, because they're, they don't have the physical dexterity to do this. So I'm hustling. I'm trying to get him out and we're, we're late and I'm feeling the pressure of him being late because I'm, I'm feeling I, your anxiety. Right? Yeah. I, I, at this point, I'm, right, you're feeling it. I'm like, oh, right. and so of course, as I'm getting anxious, I start to get testy and loud and Alex, come on. Let me get like, and so it's, it's not quite the make your bed, but it's like, it's getting there. And before I know it, Alex is sobbing into like, he's just given up and he's looking at me and he's sobbing in tears, not because he's late, but because of the way I'm treating him. I've gone too far too much. And I went, oh my gosh. And I felt horrible. Like the amount of shame. I was like, I just, that's exactly what I didn't want to do. Nothing in the world is worth putting my son in a puddle of tears. And I remember debriefing it later with my wife. And I said, gosh, this is what happened with Alex. I feel terrible. And she said, let me ask you a question, Ella. What were you doing 20 minutes earlier to set him up for success? Because in my mind, I hadn't budgeted any extra time for the rain. I just thought things were going to happen on my schedule. Right? And I think that as leaders, how often do we think things are supposed to just happen as opposed to understanding who are we working with? You know, what skills do they have? You know, a three-year-old only has a certain set of skills. And how do I coach and have the patience to come alongside? And in this case, I have to lead from the side. It's not like, let's go out the door. It's like, no, I have to literally get down there and get his boots on. And sometimes as leaders, that's what we need to do with our people. We need to get alongside with them and take them through. And we need to have the patience to do that. Now, when we do that, what ends up happening is we start to, I'll use the word empower and train them so that they learn how to do it on their own. But it's investing in this in the long term, And that is such a hard thing to do when inside of yourself personally, you are in this, but I'm in charge. I'm the commander. Let's go. You can do this. So anyway, that's kind of a long answer to your, yeah. to your, your thought on this, but, but I, it's, I, it's so important, I think, for yeah, us to recognize but, I mean, that. I think so, because it, in some ways it is the short, shortest route, isn't it, to go there? Just effing do it. Do it yeah. now because I'm your dad and that's the easiest way to get through this, yeah. right? Yeah, it, for sure. It's like, yeah, there's, there's a part in all of us that just yeah. at certain moments just wants to take that route. And it's developing oh, that like, discipline. And I do it, right? I mean, I'm guilty of that yeah, as much as anyone else. Yeah, but it's, sure. it's, it's that, yeah, as you say, discipline to deep breath. No. Or two worth 10. Oh, or 10. <laughs> <laughs> and let's take it slower. And, and absolutely that applies as a father or as a, as a leader in, a, yeah. in an organization. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I can see that. Um, so I'm interested. So yeah, we'll, 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 you know, we'll, we'll get back absolutely to, to, to and, the and actually and, and before we leave this subject i mean something to consider in the workplace I mean, you look at just parenting styles so millennials and gen z have been much more raised in the less hierarchical flat environment at home which is why when they've entered the workforce they're like i'm sorry you want to command and control me i'm out of here i've got linkedin and glassdoor i'm finding another job i, I refuse to work 
kind of like your friend Pim, who is on the, the guest on the podcast, mm -hmm. like they won't put up with that kind of leadership because they won't put up with that power hierarchy. And so what we're seeing in the world with the younger generations is they actually want a world where equality means equality, not just in name, but actually in deed. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. And it reminds me, I was doing some work uh, with, a, with a client yesterday and we, we were touching on a, a number of topics uh, when it comes to workplace culture. But one of the things we started talking about is this idea of make people awesome, right? Work to people's strengths, have them self-select into whatever activities light them up the most and mm -hmm. uh, feel like they're going to develop them the most. And it was that section of the presentation where anybody under sort of 30 really lit up and anybody sort of over 30 we kind of glazed over it. I, yeah, you, you yeah. see the, the shift. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm interested. So you know, you're, what's, the, what's the stage between you come emerging from this childhood you now with the, the rageful grandmother, the Holocaust mm -hmm. survivors, mother mm -hmm. and grandmother, uh, and, and then getting into to what you're doing now. What are those transitionary years like for you? Well, yeah, so it's funny because it's not just like this and then this. There's a lot of other things going on. So one of the things going on concurrently to all this in my childhood is my father's family. So my parents split up. My father's whole family are musicians, professional musicians. Both of his parents were cellist and violinist. My dad's a pianist. He's got four siblings. They're all musicians. I started playing the violin at the age of five. And so at the same time, I've also got this track of here's a skill. If you practice at it, you get better. So this performance element where I started playing the violin, I started going to music camp. My violin teacher played in the New York Philharmonic. I joined the Youth Symphony Orchestra of New York. I'm playing in Carnegie Hall with the orchestra on my 13th birthday. Wow. So I had this sense of if you work at something, you get better at it. And seeing the fruits of those labors and going, I like this. So I go to the high school of music and art and performing arts, which become, you know, if you've seen the movie Fame, that's the school mm. in New York. So, so I'm having this. to fame. <laughs> I did. I went to fame. I exactly. Yeah, name drop. I went to high school with Jennifer Aniston. She was a friend of mine. You know, yeah, I can name drop all day, whatever. Anyway, anyway, so here I am. I'm working away at this thing. And so I'm really interested in performance. And then I get to college and I had always been interested in theater as well. My dad's second wife was an actress and a, th a theater director. And she used to take us to plays and all sorts of stuff. So when I was in high school, I couldn't do anything other than violin because I had to specialize. But when I got to college, I started acting in plays and writing plays. And then I got involved in theater and actually went to graduate school as a, to be a professional actor. I went to a theater conservatory, a three-year master's in fine arts acting school conservatory modeled on a classical ro rotating repertory. So again, all of this. So for me, the link here, while I'm studying now in undergrad psychology, as well, I was a psychology minor for quite some time, is it's around performance and behavior. And with performance, there's such a focus on what is the impact you're having on other people. And so I think of leadership as a performing art in that what's the impact as a leader that you're having on other people? It's not, do you think you're charismatic? It's do other people think you're charismatic? It's not, do you think that you're communicating well? Do others? So closing the gap between the intentions and perception. So I got involved in doing all this stuff. And then a colleague of mine said, hey, have you ever thought about working in organizations? Because at the time, I'm already doing arts and education work. Because I was really a huge believer that the performing and the expressive arts are this, you know, I think Shakespeare said art is a mirror to nature. And I really held that ideal of, when people come away from a wonderful work of art, a play, a movie, they're changed. It changes who you are. And I really believed in that ideal. And yet I was working and I found that the, the, the most of the profession didn't work out that way. But I got involved working with an off-Broadway theater company that did a lot of educational training. So we were doing, we had contracts to work in schools. I worked on Rikers Island doing workshops with convicts, basically. Uh, helping them to think about life skills and how to communicate with each other. And it, the work was amazing. And from there, a friend of mine said, hey, have you ever thought about working in organizations? Like I said, like, like businesses, corporations? Like, why would I do that? I'm not a sellout, you know? So that was, that was my model, right? Because I, I come from a family of musicians and teachers who all thought you know, that big business was this horrible thing. So, so I ended up moving over and, and doing some work in organizations. And I, I come to find out that people in organizations are actually human beings like the rest of us. 
you know, they're just people and they happen to be working in large organizations who were trying to get stuff done. And then I realized that, wow, all of these organizations are about creating products and services that help the world to go around. So I'll just pull stuff up. Like, for example, like here's my glasses case. There's a company that actually spends all day long thinking about how to produce these and then to market them and to sell them so that I have a glasses case or my computer mouse or here are a pair of glasses or my cell phone. I mean, that that's what commerce is, you know, at its core. And so I thought, wow, how can I help people do things that basically make the world work? Not such a bad thing. Um, and that's how I got involved with focusing on helping people everywhere, not just outside of businesses, but also in organizations that were doing things that had a mission and a purpose. So that sort of led me to doing the work of leadership development in organizations. Right. Um, well, from what you've just said there, what fascinates me is walking into a prison. So you're, from the background you had, how, how were you... How did they take to you, right? How did they take to me? So here's, so I didn't just kind of go from like, hey, I'm a violinist. Let me walk into a, like, you know, we're missing a couple of steps in the story. So I need to back up. So when I was in theater school, this was out the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, I was, it's three years, there's only 16 of us. And one of my classmates, this guy, John, John had been through this training early in our first year. And it was a training for men, basically helping men to become more emotionally intelligent how to kind of step into being more clear as communicators and to be clear on what your mission and purpose in the world is. So John does this training and he tells me about it. And it sounds great, but you know, it costs a few hundred dollars and I'm a broke student. So I'm like, ah, that sounds great, John. But I watched John change over the next couple of years and really develop. And I thought, whatever, he, whatever he's having, I want some of that. And so in our third year, final year, I ended up going on this training and this training was run by an organization that's now called the Mankind Project. And the training is called the New Warrior Training Adventure. And the idea behind the name is that in the past, the old warriors did all their fighting on the outside. Like the battle was with the enemy on the outside, whereas the new warrior, it's really about taking a look at who is that battle? What is that battle inside of you? How do you take a look at those parts of yourself that you hide, repress, and deny? and really make peace and understand. And that's really where I, you know, all the stuff I just talked to you about my mother, my grandmother, it wasn't until after I did this training that I started to have the fluency or even the awareness to be able to describe that entire dynamic. I wouldn't have had it without that training. So I go on this training and it blew my mind. It was one of the most powerful weekends of my entire life. And suddenly I realized, oh, here are some models of healthy masculine people. These are healthy men that I had never seen examples of. Because if you look in the general culture, we have a lot of boys who never really mature into, be, be, uh, uh, by, into becoming mature men. And so you end up people with lots of people in positions of power. You can look around the world right now and you see plenty of them, you know, who, you know, they are 20, 30, 70 years old, but they still are acting like little boys. And that's not very healthy for the world, clearly. So I got involved with this work and I started facilitating this emotional process work in the Mankind Project in these circles of men. And I had done that for a number of years before I went off and did some work working in prisons as well. So it wasn't that I just kind of walked into a prison and was like, hey, I play the violin, what do you do? Um, so I had this background in terms of that. And it's amazing. I mean, if you get to know everyone, anyone really, and they don't have to be in prison, but you know, all of us have a story. All of us have been shaped deeply by experiences. And I would go so far as to say that unless you're extremely, extremely lucky, all of us have probably had a couple of hard knocks, at least along the way, that have shaped our experience of the world. Whether you want to call those traumas or whatnot, you know, definitely these things affect us. And, you know, when you start to realize that, oh my gosh, it's not just me, that other people have been wounded and that there are gifts that come out of those wounds if we're willing to heal them as opposed to suppress them, that's where the gold is. That's where we can really start to realize how we can contribute on a greater whole as opposed to pushing that stuff down or away or medicating it in some way. And it was on these, because I mean, I should say, I've also done one of these mankind weekends. I mean, I know mm -hmm. you, you went a lot further with it, um, but on your this was when you first started to talk about your childhood experiences 
in depth is that right with other with other men on the weekend yeah yeah so even before this so i had gone on a there's a pretty famous book by an author named scott peck called the road less traveled i mean i don't know if you know that book. It was, book. yeah, yeah, yeah. so it, it, it was like a number one bestseller for like eight years in the 1970s and 80s well scott peck created an organization that was that was based on building intentional community. And I went off to one of these community building workshops for a weekend. And this is the first place where I heard someone actually share something authentic about their own selves, something personal. And I was sitting in a circle with these people and this person shared this. And at that moment, I had this jaw dropping realization of, oh my gosh, I'm not the only one in the world who's totally screwed up. Because I think it's so many of us, unless we've had people who have shared honestly with us, it's easy to think it's just us. And so for me, the work in the Mankind Project, especially, it was very healing and it was very, and when I say healing is because I could now come to terms and look at my childhood in the mirror and not completely flip out or not shut down. I could actually start to pick it apart and unwind all the tangled knots of all these behaviors and start to make sense of them. Because I have a mentor who always says, you cannot change what you don't notice. So I think that the first step to any kind of personal or professional development is self-awareness. You have to become more aware. You know, what is my mindset? What are my beliefs? Because my beliefs are shaping my behavior. So if I think the world is an unsafe place, I'm going to act in a very specific way. If I think the world is a trusting place, I'm going to act in a very different way. So for me, all those pieces shaped my ability to talk about these things and certainly to do things differently in my own life. Right. And, and what, okay, so, so that's, that set you up for this work. And it was that style of work that you then started to take into, well, for example, prisons, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah Facilitating no, sure. people having. Yeah, yeah, oh, for sure. About and, themselves. And, and here's the thing. I mean, so for me, when I've done this work, you know, when I go off and do, and I still do them, you know, personal development retreats, workshops, or work with people coaching one on one. I mean, the level of depth we go pretty, I can't see on the screen, like pretty deep. You can go pretty deep. I mean, people will go as deep as they want to go. When I'm working in a corporate setting, I mean, we might touch, but in general, if you look at the discourse in a corporate environment around when we get honest with each other, I mean, the level of honesty, like we're just asking for just a little bit more than just the superficial, hi, how are you? How's the project? You know, have we hit our deadlines? I mean, just to go a little bit more like, hey, you know, actually it's been tough because, you know, my dad's in chemo and I had, you know, whatever, like that's the, ooh, is that okay? You know, it's like in the corporate world, we're still learning. And what the good news is, and I think the good news coming out of the coronavirus pandemic is the level of discourse for actually having genuine, real, authentic conversations with other human beings who are dealing with the muck of life. Because look, we're all facing these issues of illness, sickness, and death this year because we have a global pandemic going on. So a, a, a door has been opened to having a much realer conversation with the people around you because of it. So all of which to say is, yeah, the level of depth hopefully can grow as a result of this. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really important point, and and it's something that I reflect on. In that, you know, as businesses, we we know that if if people can show up powerfully, creatively, authentically, they can make a bigger difference in the workplace. Like intuitively, I think people get that, and certainly the route for me to have those fruits is the word you use. Yeah, you know those uh, those that ability to express myself in that way comes from doing the deeper work. It's like, you can't, you can't have all of this outward, loving, giving, creative expression, unless you've done the work inside. You have to go within to go without, right? Absolutely. And, 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 and yet, as you say, in the corporate context, we, we don't allow ourselves to, to do that deep digging to get to those fruits, right? Yeah. And it's so interesting, Richard, because as you say that, obviously you can't, you can't ask other people to do what you haven't done yourself. And particularly if we look in an organizational setting, leadership sets the tone. So if a leader is not willing to deep dive and be authentic and expressive and creative, no one else around them is going to because they haven't role modeled that. And so you can't expect anyone else to show up and do all this stuff if you haven't done it yourself. So 
you know, I always say that the level of development within an organization is directly proportional to the level of we'll call consciousness of the, we'll call it the CEO, the top leaders. Because if you don't do the work at the top, you frankly, you can't hold it. You can't see it. You can't be able to embrace an environment and a culture that is going to support deeper, more authenticity, more creativity, more vulnerability, you know, more empathy. Because if you, you can't give what you don't have. So, right. Yeah. No, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that came to me as you're sharing that, just what, one salient recollection from my weekend on the Mankind Project was, I know we're not supposed to give away too many of the details, but it's a, it's a particular sharing circle where you deal with sexual stuff, right? Yeah. And I remember that, was, that, being, that weekend being uh, the first time I'd shared certain aspects of my sexual history with other men in a really authentic sure. way. And yeah, that was a really powerful opening for me to do a lot more work in that area, not, not with that organization, but yeah. you know, it was a starting point for me. Yeah, well, again, what you're just touching on there, Richard, and whether it's on the Mankind Project Weekend or anywhere is, it's the power of, you know, they like to say sunlight is the best disinfectant, right? And so this idea of like all these feelings that, you know, most of us have hidden so much of the time, if we can give them a safe place to air out and sh shine some light on what has been in shadow, suddenly we can transform, transform and transcend that and move on to that and start to understand that because I mean, there's so many subjects in our society that become taboo, but are essentially part of being human. Sexuality is one. Power is another. Health is another. Money and finances. I mean, a lot of people would rather get naked than talk about what they have in their bank account, right? So, I mean, so there's all these things that we have, but you know what? Money is a part of life. Sex is a part of life. And it's amazing, you know, I just spent two years living in the Netherlands, you know, and just the cultural difference between the, the Netherlands and the US just in, around just what, you know, there's no one size fits all. I mean, every culture shapes its own sense. And then there are the subcultures or families within that where what is okay for us to talk about? What is not okay for us to talk about? And I think part of the journey of development is learning how to put the mirror up and look inward, reflect back what, what's inside. And for so many people, looking in the mirror is, is a scary proposition because it hasn't been safe up until this point. So my encouragement to anyone listening is this isn't the kind of work that is best done alone. Like find an organization or find a coach or a friend, someone who can help guide you and give you. And when I say guide, not like tell me, I mean, I'm not a big believer in gurus because I think you can get into very weird cultish behavior quickly. But what I'm suggesting here is find support. You know, you shouldn't have to do this all on your own because it's scary. It's, 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 it's scary and it's necessary, you know, and I like to say that part of becoming a leader is learning how to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It doesn't necessarily get easy. I'm not like, Oh, I'm comfortable now. This is awesome. No, it's still scary. But how do I learn how to reframe stuff? How do I, I've learned now how to reframe of, Oh my gosh, this is scary crap to okay, I'm on my growing edge. This is learning. I, I know that the way through this is through this. And that takes courage and that takes time and some patience. And it's not like you do it once and you're done. It's like layers of an onion to continue to come back around. There's deeper and deeper roots. So, but this is the journey of life. I mean, to me, this is the journey of development. Now you can hear all this and say, you know what? I'd rather just medicate myself. And that's a choice. You can do that if you want. That's not the path I'm taking. So there you go. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's medicate, but it's also like stick to my leadership patterns that I know work and get results. Right? Yeah. Well, and you bring yeah. up such a good point there because so many people are like, what if people in an organization don't want to change? Well, you know what? If they think they're good enough, they're not going to. Like I'm, you know, we're successful enough or I'm making whatever money or, you know, it's not, do I really want to hear from my people feedback? Maybe I don't want to hear it. In which case, that's the limit to growth. And just know that that might be okay. And that might come with a cost where you might now only attract certain people who are only going to go so far. And that's going to come with it. But if you're okay with that, you're okay with that. You know, And you'll see the consequences where they come. It sort of depends on what your perspective of what the path is going to be for you. Right, right. And, and well, and that maybe that's a that's a good place to to just touch into what are these levers that allow us to grow. And in the book, you enumerate three: right, connection, communication, collaboration. Uh, 
Now we don't want to we don't want to sort of divulge the whole book here, right? Uh, you know, no, sure we can divulge we, the whole book. You still have to. Re- <laughs> I mean, there's no way we could cover the whole book in the, the time we have anyway. So no, I mean, I'm happy to share any of those. Yeah, pieces. just yeah, maybe just start. To, yeah, touch on. Um, well, maybe yeah. Let's start with those three, and you know how yeah. how how do you um. Yeah, I suppose why why those three, and then what's important as as pertains to connection, communication, and collaboration. Sure, sure. Yeah, I certainly wasn't like I sat down, like I'm going to write a book and I'm going to come up with three nifty things that I'll start with the letter C. That wasn't how this emerged at all. So my background, I've been doing this work, leadership development organizations for nearly 25 years. And what I noticed after working with thousands and thousands of groups is I started to see these patterns. Earlier on, I see these patterns would emerge and I would hear stories. People would share specific stories. And of course, I'm a big, you know, I come from the world of the theater. I love stories. So I started taking notes and, I was, and I'd write these notes down. And then in 2011, I started a blog. And so the blogs became a place to capture the stories of what had happened in the field with real people, real leaders, real time. And over time, I started blogging every week. I had hundreds and hundreds of blog posts. So I reviewed them all. And what I found is that they started falling into one of three buckets. A whole bunch of the stories were around leaders needing to connect, leaders needing to communicate, leaders needing to collaborate. And that became the themes, the three sub-themes of the book. You know, these are the domains that people need to do well in order to lead successfully. And so connection, what does that mean? I mean, and I get, obviously I go deep into this into the book, but to me, there's a couple of big pieces. At its core, when we think about connection, leadership is a relationship. That's what it is. It's a relationship between a leader and someone who chooses to follow. And the quality of that relationship is based on the quality of connection. So if you're a leader and you want to create a stronger connection, what do you do? And that's where I get, I'm like, I'm really into, let's be practical about this because I can't just say go connect because I I don't know what that means. What do I actually do? Well, I kind of, I flesh this out deeply in the book, but there's two main things. Number one is you want to strengthen connection through empathy. turns out that empathy is the superpower of connected leaders. And I define empathy as showing people that you understand them and that you care how they feel. Now, as you hear that, you think, got it, got it, good. I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. I'll be empathetic. The fact is, especially, especially in our business worlds, being empathetic and leading with empathy is a lot harder than it looks because we have a lot of things that are working at cross purposes to showing people how that we understand them and care how they feel. I'll give you a couple of examples. Number one, last time I checked, everyone I talked to in the business world, how's your day? Oh, I'm so busy. I'm really busy. I'm crazy busy, right? So the first thing is showing people you understand them and care how they feel isn't some item you can just check off your to-do list. Okay, Richard, um, I'm going to be empathetic. Got check, check, check. No, the fact is showing empathy means having patience. And like me with my three-year-old son putting on his boots, patience is in short supply in our world today. And yeah, the challenge with technology is, you know, we've got all these emails, got 75 emails just came into your inbox in the last five minutes. Information moves at the speed of light, but human relationships take time. And so part of leadership wisdom is knowing that there's a time and a place to go fast. Yeah. And go through it, get it, got it good. And then there's a time to slow down and really listen and really listen with, and I call it listening with purpose. So that's one piece. The other piece is well, a lot just, of people- Just as you say that, I'm just thinking, I talk about trauma time. I remember a time early in my career, and I've shared this before on a podcast, but I, I, I was a young manager. I'd been doing really well with my team, and I was working for one of the you know, big four consultancies. The partner was coming to the project, right? This yes. big thing. And he's got this office he's, he's for the day, and we've all got our sort of 10 minute slot to go and update him on how we're well doing with a project. And I'd you know, rehearse my spiel, and I'd come into yeah. the office, and there's actually two senior partners there, right, ready to listen to me. Yeah. And I lay it all out. And for the entire 10 minutes, the guy, this was when we had Blackberries, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. He's, he's scrolling through his back the whole time. And I never forgot it. And I felt absolutely, you know, on the yeah. floor after that, dejected. Yeah. It's so it's yeah, um, yeah. exactly. There was no exactly. connection. None. Exactly. And you know, you're so aware of that. And so many of us have had experiences like that because. Ultimately, as a leader, like the most precious resource you have is your presence, your time, your focus, your attention. That makes your presence. So what are you doing to connect? And then are you okay with people having an emotion here or there? You know, a lot of people, I remember I was working with one, one, another one of the big four consulting firms. I was working with a partner 
and he, his name is Bob. And he said, you know, Alan, I don't ask my people how they feel. And you know why I don't ask them? Because if I ask them, you know what might happen? They might tell me. I don't think I want all that information, right? So he sees it as this Pandora's box of, holy crap, we've got work to do. We don't have time for that stuff. So Bob subscribed to, and maybe you've heard this expression, this check your feelings at the door policy. This uh, is, yeah. we got to check our feelings at the door, which is a funny expression. If you can stop and think about it, as human beings, we can't literally check our feelings at the door. What we end up doing instead is we suppress our feelings at the door which is precisely what's happening. In fact, Deloitte did this great study a few years ago that found that 61% of employees worldwide feel the need to cover their identities, that they have to put on a mask. Now, obviously coronavirus, we're all physically putting on masks, but this was like a metaphorical mask that they, they felt like they couldn't be real. They couldn't bring their whole selves to work. And as we know, is when you feel like you've got to put on that metaphorical mask, you can't but help to be disconnected, which creates lower trust, lower performance culture. So these are a couple of the things that get in the way of becoming a more empathetic and more connected leader. The other big thing around connectivity has to do with what are you doing to create credibility in the people's minds that you're working with? Because we said leadership is a relationship and the person who has the final say, the judge of the quality of the relationship isn't the leader. It's the person who chooses to follow much in the same way, Richard, the credibility of that partner who was sitting in the room scrolling through that Blackberry went in the toilet for you because you're like, excuse me, this is my 10 minutes and you're not even giving me an eyeball, let alone any attention, right? And so their credibility goes down. So one of the things we have to do as leaders is, you know, I'll go back to one of my theatrical metaphors is the spotlight is on us, right? We're on stage as a leader. You are being watched all the time and all of your behaviors are being magnified. So yeah, you're scrolling on a black You're just thinking, I'm just checking my email. Whereas Richard's thinking, no, you're ruining my life right now. Yeah, you're not exactly. scrolling. I will right? never recover from this moment, you are. Seriously, <laughs> exactly. So, so there are some certain things that we can do to grow our credibility. And I go through a lot of different examples. I, and a simple one is, are you showing up to every meeting that you say you are on time? I mean, that's the simplest thing and probably the most important thing to do because it's the easiest thing to measure. Like you're either here or you're not. And as soon as you start showing up late, you know what the story is that other people are telling you. And if you do it consistently late, oh, there's Richard again. And, you know, and your credibility is going to be in the toilet before you know it. So these are a couple of specific practical tools that you can take to become a more connected leader. So that's connection. And then, you know, we can talk about communication and collaboration, but it's the same format in terms of there's the principle, there are the things that get in the way of you doing it well. And then here are a bunch of simple practical tools that you can use to become more effective in either becoming a more effective communicator or a more effective collaborator. Right, right. Yeah, and, and actually I think you've answered the next question I was going to ask because you, you, you start the book by reflecting on your childhood. Yeah. And the early models of leadership for you. And a big part, it seems to me, of you becoming an effective leader and an effective coach of other leaders was you unpicking and unpacking that childhood experience and, and working on it. And yet in the book, you don't really emphasize that when it comes to coaching others around leadership. But I think what I'm hearing from you is what you're, tr what you're doing here is giving people practical tools as a means to make a start, because we can't assume that these people are ready to go to the depths that you, you know, you describe yourself having gone to. Is that, is that yeah. right? Yeah, that's a fair assumption. And I also think, you know, you know, a lot of people who are in organizations, you know, we're not, we haven't signed up for group therapy and, <laughs> right. you know, and you're not a licensed psychologist, you know, and I don't expect you to be, you know, really to me, I, I like to say that, you know, no one needs you to be a psychologist, but what you do need to be is an empathetic human is realizing, look, there are human beings you're working with, you know, we're all in the people business. And how do you create an environment where people can perform at their best? And part of that means that if there's kind of busyness or emotional baggage that's getting in the way, how can you give them a space and a time and a safe environment where they can put that to the side, you know, and you know, look, they may need professional help. And you would say, I think you need professional help. Like, I can't, I, I'm your boss, I'm your manager, I can't do this, but how can I support you? And to do it in a way that is supportive and caring of the whole person. Yeah, I mean, I don't, the book is not designed to be a, a self-help book. It's really designed for any aspiring leader 
who wants to become someone, and I use this term, like have a facilitative mindset. The fact is so many of us who have ended up in leadership roles were really high performers, right? I mean, that's how we got there. People like, oh, you know, Richard, you're good at this. So you'll, let's manage a bunch of people who are good at this. And as we know, the challenge in that situation is how do you take high performers and yet then transform them so they know how to facilitate the high performance of others? Those are two completely different skill sets, right? right? Completely different. They are completely right. different. And so for me, the goal is then to cheat to teach these high performers the facilitative mindset. And I use that word facilitative very consciously because the word facilitate comes from the same Latin root as the French word facile, which means to make things easier. So how can you help people to achieve and exceed performance goals easier, right? And so the thing is, there's only one of you and you can't clone yourself. So you're going to need to learn how to build capacity into the people around you. And that's through adopting a facilitative mindset, which means taking a look at what are your beliefs around leadership? And are you still stuck in the industrial age ideas of command and control, which many of us still have some because it's hard to get rid of all that. And then once you kind of adopt this facilitative mindset, what are the facilitative skill sets that you need to, to create? And that's where I get into that there are skill sets around connection, there are skill sets around communication and skill sets around collaboration that people can adopt so that they can help people to work smarter and not just harder. Because let's face it, we're all working pretty hard today. And this, this is the challenge of working in 2020 and beyond. Right, right. I, I guess it still begs the question for me to some extent. And then that, and I, that to the extent that people's beliefs may be um, rooted in their childhood experiences, mm -hmm. Right, maybe the extent to which they need to go and work on that in order to develop a new mindset. So when you find leaders and you think, oh, hang on, this isn't going to be a few affirmations and a bit of a tweak in style. I think this person's going to need to go and do some deeper work. How do you handle that? Yeah, well, you bring up a good point. And before we get into how I handle it, I want to step back for a second, because the way you said, I want to kind of put a little asterisk about something you said here, because when people hear, a lot of people hear, oh, you know, I'm doing this because this is how I was raised or this was in my childhood, that can feel a little pop psychology. Oh, I do this because my mom was this way. And, so, and you know, we have to be really careful about that mindset because I think a lot of people use that framework as a crutch. It's like, well, I'm just this way because my parents raised me this or this. And there's a lot of, and when we do that, we end up in a lot of victimology and blame. It's like, I can't help it. And I think what's really important, and this is a very subtle distinction, but I want to bring it out because I am bringing it out, <laughs> um, which is instead of me saying, oh, you know, I don't trust people because my grandmother told me not to trust people. Like, that is a very victim disempowering mindset as opposed to what I'm walking around with is I have internalized a message that I learned somewhere that I haven't yet rescripted. So the message that I learned that I'm still seeing show up sometimes is that you can't trust other people. Now I can go, where did I learn that message? I heard it from my grandmother, yet that message, look, I'm 52 years old. That's my, at this point, that's my message. So yeah. I, so I want to start by framing it this way. So well, I think that's really important. You all, every, the way you just expressed it, that's all I language. I have this belief. Yeah, I've been I have this belief. Yeah. Yeah, Very which important. is because it's so empowering because if I have this belief, that means that I can change the belief versus if someone did this to me, then I'm a victim. I can't do anything about it. And I think it's so important for all of us to step back and go, no, these are my messages. I own them. I may have internalized them. They served me at a certain time in my life, but they're no longer serving me. So to, to go back to your question is like, when do you start to do that? I think that, you know, for me, it's really hard to separate these things out. I think in that the journey of development moving forward always is accompanied by a certain level of self-reflection, whether that's going back 20, 30 years, or whether it's going back to, I tried this out yesterday, how did it work? I mean, I need to be able to reflect on all of these different dimensions because all of them give me new data and feedback on how I need to change course and adjust moving forward. Right, right. 
yeah that that makes sense and that yeah i relate to that as you know we're always the sum of our sort of past and future and present you know in this yeah in this, and, and and past isn't just when i was seven years old past mm. is you know what i just did in the meeting 10 minutes ago mm. and do i actually stop and reflect on this you know mm. i like to joke and I write about this in the book too, is that, you know, we all know people who have been in leadership roles for 20 years and some people are leaders with 20 years of experience. And then there are leaders with one year of experience 20 times <laughs> because <laughs> they haven't grown at all. They just keep doing the same stuff over. So I think if you want to be a 20 year experienced leader, you need to reflect on all those different moments along the way and then do something with them as opposed to just doing the same old, same old. Cause you know, how many people have said, if you do what you always did, you'll get what you always got. And if you're interested in changing and having different results, you've got to do something differently today and tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think the other thing that, that I reflect on when I, you know, read your book was we need to try these things in order to experience where we might have blocks, right? Yeah. We need to take on these behaviors and try coming from these beliefs in order sometimes to expose the fact that our internal system isn't ready to to operate in that way right to, to stir ourselves up in order to get the growth so yeah yeah so what you just touched on there is it's the difference in philosophy between what we call an outside in or an inside out approach is that sometimes maybe the way to do it is just to try on the new behavior the new belief and it's funny you mentioned that because actually in drama school there's two different real philosophies around how you train actors one is this outside in approach that is you know, if I want to, let's say, play uh, a, a, let's say a famous Hamlet, right, is that what I can try to do is put my body into the shape, like the physical gesture and find the tone, the voice and put on the right costume to inhabit the role of Hamlet. And that's sort of this outside in approach. And then there's the inside out approach made famous by the method actor school of Lee Strasberg. And, and the idea is that you have to find the internal life of the character and understand the biography and work from the emotions outwards. And that's going to inform how you end up gesturing and talking and moving and speaking. And so it's interesting because in some ways they both work. And I think what's important for us as our own instrument as leaders, right? Because as actors, you're your own instrument, but as the performing artist of a leader is try different approaches and see what works. And if it's working, do more of it, right? Keep follow that rose. Like that's a, that's a clue that that works well for you. You know, and I've adopted both the outside approach, inside approach, in, inside out, outside in approach at different times. I mean, there is something to be said about the truth of sometimes you do fake it until you make it, right? Sometimes that's what you do um, and that's necessary. And sometimes it doesn't work that way, so. Yeah, that 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 really, yeah, resonates. And I've, I've certainly found with my own development, it's both, both are important, right? I, yeah. Yeah, the outside in trying on new behaviors, throwing myself into to new experiences will have me, develop new mindsets, new skills, new so on. But then it also bring up a load of stuff from my past, which I can work on on a therapeutic basis. Yeah. Um, and equally in and of itself, just going back and working on through my feelings and working on my past will allow new behaviors just to simply sort of merge organically and spontaneously without me having to reach from them just, just by unblocking certain parts of myself. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, uh, it's, it's uh... It's a great, uh, and I love the, the acting met metaphor. I'd not, you know, yeah. yeah, not heard that before expressed in that way. Great. So, uh, so the book's there, cracking the the leadership code. Um, what are you finding in terms of its response? You know, are you, you know, what's been the feedback so far? Oh, well, the feedback has been very positive. I mean, we've gotten really great buzz and launch all around. Um, you know, the book has been reviewed in Forbes magazine. It got a really great review there. Um, I've gotten a chance to meet with lots of people on various podcasts. I've had uh, readers who have bought the book literally on six continents right in and just talk about how impactful it's been. I've had people talk about how it's completely changed their approach to leading. And, you know, when you get letters like that and emails like that, it's sort of everything else is gravy. You know, it's like, okay, my work here is done. I'm, I'm good. So, you know, it's had great response so far. And what's so nice is so many people have been writing in and saying, you know, it, it was so useful, but beyond that, it was actually fun to read. You know, <laughs> that was one of my goals because as you know, many business books are just God awful boring and just, oh, another model. And like, here's another two by two matrix and here's an, uh, you know, it's just, you know, we get kind of so kind of in love with our own models. And I mean, my model is so simple. It's three concentric circles, connection, communication, collaboration, got it. 
because to me, models are not the territory and the territory is life. And that's what I want people to really focus on is be able to understand, a, have a framework and be able to move into it and start to apply it and practice it to get those results. So you know, overall, the, the, the response to the book has been phenomenal so far. I'm, 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 I'm thoroughly, thoroughly happy about how things are going. Right. And I, yeah, I'll say it's, it's just story after story after story. That's what's great about the yeah, book. It yeah. doesn't feel like you're reading like a, it's not yeah. like, here's the model and let me take you through it. Yeah, no, there's it tons of like stories. Just well, like I've been trying to do here, this is how we learn. I mean, humans learn best through storytelling. And so stories bring concepts to life in a way that we can relate to. And all of the science about, you know, mirror neurons and sympathetic reflexes, this is what story, this is the power of storytelling. Yeah, so the book is, you won't go more than two pages at most without another story because it's, that's my guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And has it whetted your appetite for another one in the works? Or do you think this is it uh, for, yeah, for that? No, I mean, I, I love the idea of writing. Right now, I've got so much else going on with my business and kind of moving things else. Now, you know, so much of my work was face-to-face, -face, so kind of pivoting things to make them all in the virtual space. So that's just taking a lot of time. I look forward, I love writing. I love, you know, I don't know how much I love writing as much as I love having written. <laughs> There's two different things. But I, what I love about writing is how writing forces me to clarify my thinking. I mean, there's nothing like writing to sharpen your thoughts about something. So I love that and I miss that in-depthness uh, of this. It has that in-depthness, I could work on that grammar, the, the depth of that. And uh, so, yeah, I think there will, there will be more books. I, the question is, I'm not, I'm not putting myself on a timeline. My agent said, okay, we're ready for book number two. I'm like, yes, you are. I'm not. So we're going to work on number one for a while still, but uh, we're getting there. We're doing all sorts of cool stuff. We're, we're taking the book's content and we're turning it into some tech, using a technology platform to turn it into a 30 day leadership challenge and doing some gamification around it. So getting people to work in a collective community. So all kinds of cool stuff is happening with the book. And is that available now for people? The, the that is. Program? So the 30 day program, I mean, I know we're recording this at the end of September, 2020. I'm launching the first of these programs uh, October the 5th. So depending on when we air, this may be in the works, but I'm sure we'll be doing another one in the future. So if people just want to stay tuned and, and follow my work, um, I'll, I'll definitely be announcing and promoting the next ones on my website, which is alahunkins.com. So I'm sure we can link to all that stuff. In the yeah, show absolutely. Notes. We'll put that yeah. all in the description. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Oh, Richard, I think I'm, the pleasure was all mine. I mean, I love the way that we, we went all over the place and I kind of got into some deep stuff that I got to say I haven't talked about before. So thank you for eliciting such honesty out of this. Oh, well, lad, I'm delighted. <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again. Enjoy, uh, I guess, the rest of your day in New York. You, you, you're beaming live from new york is that right? i'm actually in massachusetts massachusetts so I'm sorry three hours i'm only three hour drive from new york but uh, yeah i'm across the pond from you so all right thanks again thank you thank you